I, I don't know whether we could call it a, a Q&A or just more detail, I guess, I don't know. But um, if, if, if you pick up where you left off, uh, you'd be great. <coughs> okay. So, <clears throat> I think what I'll do is uh, try to give you the main point of what I was trying to talk about. Um, and then hopefully that will help you relate it to your own experience again. <clears throat> so, in our experience as people, um, we want to move forward somehow in terms of our own development and our own experience. We want to do that as a society. We want to do that as individuals. Um, we want to do that increasingly as um, a world. So what I mean by move forward is that we want to evolve and improve our experience somehow. Um, so we always want things to be better, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. um, and because of how we have come to view reality, or this physical experience, um, in general, as a collective, we tend to think that moving forward or evolving means improving our physical experience through technology or whatever. Now, in the sense that I've been talking about it, the application of what Lucifer is, is our application of our intellect um, Thank you. or our, yeah, our intellect to improving our physical experience because we only think of ourselves as physical and we don't know of anything else or what there even could be other than this physical experience. So because of that, out of our uh, ignorance of our higher self or our true self or the rest of who what we are, we assume that the physical is the only thing that we have, so we will improve it and use what we find here in the physical experience for the purposes of evolving ourselves. So in other words, we equate our evolution as human beings with our development of physical technology. So that is Luciferian in the sense that it is in how when people usually talk about Lucifer, they're usually referring to something uh, that's negative, even though we talked about it's, it's really what you make of it. But when people usually refer to it, um, well, in a religious setting, they're referring to Satan. And as we've said, those two are not similar things. And I think that's where I left off last time. Um, and I want to get into what that is. But the way in which it manifests in the world today, um, in general, is that intellectual pursuit of technology. And even though that's just us applying our intelligence to what we think is real, um, it ends up falling short um, and being unable to carry us to where we truly need to go. The reason it falls short, or in other words, the reason that our technology and our intellect and what we think about reality and how we use that information, the reason it falls short is because exactly that. It's because it's what we think this is. It's not what we know this is. So we, in order to redeem what was usually referred to as Luciferian in a negative sense, we have to connect with reality um, in a way that allows us to go beyond what our intellect and what our thinking minds have the ability to do. And what that means is we have to learn how to go beyond physical technology. Because physical technology can only take you so far. 
Now. Welcome to Acu Conference. Please oh, wait, your conference code now. Sorry. Uh, um, so what is happening in terms of our ability to apply our intellect or thinking mind to what we think reality is, is that it is slowly approaching a, um, a limit. You will now be joined to your conference. And that limit is, um, if we think purely intellectually anyway, that limit is the ability to manipulate matter to an extremely precise, fine degree. So, when, and what that is, is actually the, the fullest, the, it's the ultimate form of physical science or the application of technology. Because if you can create technology that allows you to do whatever you want with this physical stuff, then you have reached the ultimate form of Luciferian technology that is based in your intellect. It's based in how we think about what it is and not what it is actually is. <laughs> I hope that wasn't confusing. Um, so what is happening in terms of how we think collectively is that we're reaching a point where um, we will have the ability to see the limitations in our own thinking. And it won't be apparent at first because technology is very, very enticing. Um, you can do so many different things. You can have everything that you wanted, ideally, right? But eventually, it has the effect of giving you everything that you wanted to the point where you become sick of it. Come um, what? Sick of it. Sick of it. Question. Yeah. Um, is not te is technology, is it not a reflection or a mirror for who we are spiritually? Mm. Absolutely. And the funny thing about it is physical technology can't improve unless there's a corresponding change spiritually first. Mm. Um, but if we're concentrating more on what we physically experience or see, um, how do we get those um, insights then that allow us to continue to perfect technology? I mean, there's, there's scientists who, you know, even though they espouse that they don't believe in God, they, they have these insights, you know, this, these aha moments where they have to connect to something larger than themselves to get those aha moments. Mm -hmm. How do they rationalize that? Well, I mean, they would rationalize it by rationalizing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what is actually happening is that well, we are meant to be able to manipulate matter um, because this is the, if, you, if it was like a spectrum, this is like the bottom half of what spirit is. There's no difference between spirit and matter. Mm -hmm. And since we're in the process of transforming ourselves, so will this matter be transformed as well? Um, yeah. Um, the way they do it, the way scientists do it, they call it complex intellect. I'm, I'm, I'm smarter than you, so I figured this out. When there's actually an overlap between the, the mind and the spirit. Well, the implication then is nobody else can do it because I'm smarter than you. Yes, that's it. And that's the danger, but the intellect. Um, and it actually says a lot between the relationship of what your intellect actually is and what your spirit is, because your intellect is always in service of your spirit. And the more you refine your intellect, the better you will be able to uh, translate what spirit gives to you into a more physical reality. And that's actually what's happening. But Nick, is that true? If you only if you uh, refuse to um, worship your intellect, 
I'll, I'll, I'll place it above everything else. Actually, yeah. <laughs> and that, that kind of goes without saying for anybody who's, who wants to know what this is. Because if you put the intellect at, on a pedestal, um, you can't improve it to the point where you can if you recognize what it is. Mm. So just what we did with the concept of a creator and how the long ago when religion was created. We put it on a pedestal and by doing so we forever separate ourselves from it. Mm -hmm. So people who, well, if we are trained to think materially, we do that same thing. Because the intellect is the mental tool that we use to manipulate all this material stuff. Um, that, another, I don't know, insight or question. Um, so when we put religion on a pedestal, what actually transpired is that man began to minimize revelation by calling it a dream world. And dream and stop uh, and began to put uh, borders around the dreams, and that the dream for all your children is for them to be successful in the material world, as opposed to seeing dreams or visions as as a, a spiritual entity or a, a, a reflection of the other world with. Um, with a desire for us to understand what's really going on. Is that confusing? Yeah, by virtue of putting it on a pedestal, you, it's like you put it on a place in space. And if you define space, space is something in the material world. Right. Yeah, and, and, and that limits. And, and, and you begin to focus on that thing that's on the pedestal in space that you created. So, depend, so if you look at religion from its development to its, its splendor, until it began to splendor, and to different denominations, uh, you see a strong effort to control the mind. Um, I was reading something the other day that talked about when when the scriptures were translated um, into the Greek, that there were there were um, translations that were purposely in error in order to uh, form what the desire was of the people doing the translation. In other words, they did everything they could to make it masculine and manipulative. And, and so, if you look at it from that from the beginning of that to where we are now, the branches began to come into being as a result of people be, uh, begin to think for themselves. Because it, each person who established what we call a denomination was considered a rebel. Even to, you, even to the extent where you get to the Christian scientist, who is purely intellectual and everything in between. And as you begin to put the intellect, or make it the goal rather than um, what is deeper than the intellect, you become further and further diver divorced from the very thing that would allow you to evolve for real. Instead of what it actually does, was the intellect just allows you to refine your manipulation of stuff. Uh, it's like the difference between playing with or, or manipulating stuff and learning how to understand what this stuff is and then what the implications of that are. Um, so just to maybe hopefully give it like a better example in terms of what we do or what we experience. Um, it's like when we have a decision, uh, like what I said once, we have two fork in the road, we have two ways to go. Um, and instead of list quieting our intellect and our thinking minds and learning to feel for that still small voice, uh, which is the influence of your higher self, 
um, we cut that off almost unconsciously, automatically, and then immediately begin thinking about it. We immediately apply our intellect to the situation. Um, and we begin to weigh the pros and cons, and, da, 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 da. and then we make a decision based on what we think, rather than what we know. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. Okay. And as I said before, um, that's natural. You have to do that in the beginning, because while you're learning to hear that still small voice, you still got to do stuff. But the difference is, if your intellect is not on a pedestal, if it is not something that you worship, then you recognize that it is a lower extension of your higher self, and that it is in service to that still small voice. Um, and if you recognize that even though you may have a very, very highly refined intellect, that it is not where things come from, uh, it is subordinate, then you can let things flow and not get caught up in all this intellectual stuff that we like to pretend we're so smart by using. <laughs> so, so you're saying then basically that the intellect is the is not the be-all, it's the tool to be used by the all. Excellent way to put it. So Nick, you need to read that. I uh, <laughs> homecoming <laughs> Maggie. Thank here. you very much. But I'm curious about how someone, say for example, like Nikola Tesla, could apply his intellect and achieve what he did. Yeah, um, so the intellect is kind of like, so, and even including Nikola Tesla and his group, um, the priests back in ancient, everywhere that was ancient, <laughs> um, had extremely refined intellects. And they would be the most intelligent people you would find within a thousand miles or whatever. Um, but just like Nikola Tesla, they kept themselves open to what other things they uh, possessed. Mm -hmm. So instead of just working within the confines of what they thought of as their intellect, they used their intellect to go deeper and further in than, than what the intellect could do. Okay. Um, so it's kind of, yeah, <coughs> you don't have to have a refined intellect in order to do this stuff. In order to grow spiritually, you don't. Um, but you, it is a very important or a useful tool when you do have it, as long as you remember that it's just that, it's just a tool. Um, so I'll run back to you, but so Nikola Tesla and anybody who does things that appear to be magical <laughs> um, have kept their inner self open to other possibilities. They can be totally trained scientifically, whatever, but as long as they don't hold that as the ideal and they recognize it as a tool to go further, then they themselves will keep will be open to more subtle influences that may, they may not even be aware of. And then they have all this insight all the time that they then apply their intellect to, to refine. Um, does that make sense? It does. Yeah. So, <clears throat> the intellect, um, it helps you crystallize those subtle influences that we receive all the time. And it's kind of a, it's a, it is an art and a science, learning how to do that. Learning how to listen to that still small voice and actually go with its flow. <laughs> And it's a process of trial and error <laughs> while we're in the process of learning how to recognize it. Anyway. Well, when I had when I had that accident in Nairobi, then I had almost a head-on collision oh my. with a big truck coming around the curve on my side of the road. Oh my and um, 
and we did have an accident, but when I saw the truck, I slammed on the brakes. I heard this little voice say, take your foot off the brake. Mm -hmm. And I did. And I walked away from that accident. Mm -hmm. I hurt my hand, a mix of, from glass all over me, but I walked away. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder what would have been different if I hadn't listened to that voice. I don't know. It's a bare minimum probably. Because over oh, there you drive on the left side of the road. So I was sitting on the right side of the car. He sheared off this part of the car. It missed me by this much. I mean, it just sheared it off. I, I closed my eyes, I turned like that. I looked up, there was no car there. It was like, I don't know. Excuse me, it creeps just thinking about it, but anyway. Me too. <laughs> but that little voice just said, take your foot off the brake. Mm. And see, the, the answer to that Which was the opposite of what it's we normally really think, right? Right. Yeah. And so actually, the still small voice uh, becomes the mind of the intellect if we allow it to. And if we lean towards the intellect, then we're allowing that to be our light. And if your light is dark, then the whole of you is dark, which results in catastrophes. So, so um, the the um, the skill or the need is to learn how to just to hear that voice without having to stop and hear it. Just, just you know, get to the point where it becomes what we call second nature. It's just there. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to add, uh, in situations like that, where it becomes life or death, um, all thinking stops. Because subconsciously, your, your body knows that you have to be perfectly aware in that situation in order to get all the information you can to help you make a decision. So when the thinking mind stops, you become completely alert, completely aware, you then become open to those other influences. When priests and priestesses would go through training and initiation, they would be put through situations, well, being the thinker of the life of the situations, in order to get them comfortable in that place of total, absolute awareness so that they could hear that voice and, as Pastor said, learn to think with it. Um, and that tradition holds true through everything, including Masons, which is where they got it from. So when they do all this stuff and you become a Mason, that's kind of like symbolic of what was actually done. Um, when you had to like swim through underground tunnels and think you were going to get eaten by crocodiles, that, the priest would say, I'm sorry, you got scared, try again next year, or whatever. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> you can't do it yet. So, I mean, this is going off on a tangent, but the reason it became... So, if you, if you told the secrets of the mystery school you were trying to enter, they would kill you. And not originally, but more recently in time they would kill you. Because the whole point is, if you break the secrecy, if you know it's not something, if you know they're just trying to put you through an experience, they're not actually trying to kill you, the whole thing doesn't work. Mm. So they would kill you <laughs> if you ever told that. Because then you just invalidated that whole method of training, because if you go in there thinking nothing's going to happen, you don't have the same things happen psychologically or spiritually that you need to have happen. So something you just said then was, um my interpretation. Um, 
you gotta you gotta stop thinking in a sense. And so it's tap it's similar to the idea of being still and knowing that I am God in a sense. In other words, whenever we think we tend to create whether you know by and we tend to use those thoughts that come into our mind and shape them ourselves. Um, just because that's what we ordinarily do. But when we stop, it's sort of like meditation, when you stop and you're not actively thinking, it, those, the space that, oh, my word, space doesn't mean anything, that place where other thoughts would come in that I would manipulate and, and, and create, those are not there, and so it allows, it's sort of like the recreation of creation. It allows space for wisdom, for knowledge, from the all to come in. Right. And, exactly, that's what creating the space is always for. To get the stuff out of the way so you can complete your ability to feel your higher self. But is that a reasonable, um, is that a reasonable then, um, another reasonable explanation of the be still and know that I am, is what mm -hmm. it is. And, and let me add to that, it's, it's, um, we don't stop thinking, because we have to think, it's just that we think in a disconnected state. Okay, yeah. So when you temporarily stop thinking and allow yourself to reconnect to what is in you, then that can influence the rest of your thinking. So you can like complete the process of thinking by reconnecting it to your source. So that when you do think, it's not this disconnected, confusing process. It's a flowing motion from your inner self. Mm. But yeah, so meditation, all of that is designed to give you some peace and quiet so that you can learn to feel for the influence of your higher self. Now, the, the weird thing is, well, the ironic thing is you, you, we do this all the time anyway. We're just unconscious of it. So even when you speak, you are moving or you're, you're choosing a, you're willing yourself in a particular direction or willing yourself to move in a particular course of action and you're choosing the words, uh, the process of willing comes direct from your inner self. Yep. Um, the issue I think that we have with will is that we subconsciously or consciously equate will with with thinking or focusing on something until it transpires, as opposed to recognizing that will is the um, a source of life or the light of life that that's available or that flows through us that actually brings into manifestation the the the, uh, uh, the thing that you will uh, the life it, it's a it's a form of creation as opposed to um, meditating on something by virtue of thinking about it constantly or continuously and bringing it to being. Is you creating it? Yeah. We're back to that. Who's, in, who's running the shop? It's either you or the creator. So are you willing to open yourself to that or are you willing something into being? In which case it's you. Well, that, and, and, and that's exactly what I'm saying, that... Yeah. But that's the classic thing we've been talking about in here, every rubric's way you can twist it. Who's, who's, whose energy is it? Is it you trying to manage it? I, I, I agree with what you're saying. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's why we have expressions like, you know, yeah, you will into being, and you hear all these people saying, if you, can, you can live your dream, but nobody's focused on the word your. They just focus on a dream, yeah. and it will your dream into being, without understanding what that implies. Like it's, oh, a, we, it's necessarily got, a good thing. Let me just. We we talked about that before, but we we've 
the you that you experience yourself to be right now um, is just one end of the polarity of your total self. And the other end of the polarity is the creator. So you, quote unquote, you and the creator are the same. But that is not real to your experience yet, or our experience. So we are trying to reincorporate the rest of who and what we are. Now, we can say that we and the creator are the same, but that knowledge comes from those who have already done that, and they recognize themselves as it. Um, so what we're trying to do is break down the experience, or our experience, and learn how to recognize the situations that allow us to reincorporate the rest of what we are. So we can say that, or we can already say that we know who we are. It's just that it has not become real to us yet. So knowledge, quote unquote, in the ultimate sense, is direct experience of something. So we are trying to gain that knowledge concerning who and what we are and make it real to us. Anyway, does that add something? So what we're doing is understanding how all these experiences that we have on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as things that we can do like meditation or whatever it is, affect your ability to do that. And bring into realization the fullness of who and what you actually are. And creating a space or recognizing that still small voice is a skill that we must have and develop in order to keep going in this process. And the will, like we were just talking about, is closer to the source of who and what you are than your thinking mind. Because the will initiates the process of thinking. Thinking is an extension, or uh, an outwards extension of a process that is initiated by your will. But you can move the seat of your conscious awareness deeper into your own source, in other words, deeper into your will, so that you learn to think, quote unquote, with your will, as opposed to with your intellect. Yep. When, and when you, um, what you say, when you think with your will as opposed to your intellect, um, you uh, don't try, you don't try to shape it. You, 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 what, whatever, when you think with your will, you don't determine what the outcome uh, is going to be. And what you find out eventually, or what you become aware of by virtue of thinking with your will, is that all the things that you are searching for is you. Whether it be wisdom, peace, understanding, whatever. You, you become to an awareness that that's who you are as opposed to uh, something that's uh, external of you, that you're searching for. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, wait, so you're saying will isn't just uh, an auto, to, to use it in just physical terms, impulse that you can't stop. You're going to will something. You, the question right. is, through what, how do, you, how do you channel that energy? You can't stop. So, so if your brain's full of all these thoughts, you're going to will whatever sticks itself to, which means you're going left, right, or whatever, as opposed to learning how to have that, to employ that, that you cannot resist anyway, toward that sense of connectedness too. It, it, but in and of itself, I'm just asking the question. Uh -huh. It's neutral, I guess, in that sense, unless the inclination of the will is to push you towards something, some understanding. And then you do or don't get there depending on what you've got, the busyness you have in your whatever that gets in the way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and, and okay. I, I, it is neutral. It, okay. Jesus says what? Let thy will be done. 
let your will be what what you want it to be. In other words, um, the energy that I'm focused on right now is 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 being challenged by my mind. Um, my mind is telling me to protect this physical body, not to submit to the crucifixion thing. So what I'm actually doing is submitting the energy, the life energy that I have to the Creator to do with what He chooses so that um, the uh, crucifixion, and I use that loosely, can take place because I don't believe it's what we think it is. He, he is um, actually combining or recognizing the life force that he has, I don't want to say control over, but that he can dominate or manipulate. But So he does not want to take the chance of not doing what the Creator wants him to do. So we have opportunity to bring... about will, I'm not talking about um, desire, terms of thought, or wishful thinking. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about life energy. Um, it's, it's, I, can, I see this as, when we talk about the Luciferian experience, I, I, see, I see this as the light that Lucifer brings. He brings the will. He bears the will. And you determine what, you know, how you're going to use it. And, and, and that is... That, uh, and that will determine what kind of world you live in. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It just, my only point was, like Lucifer and the light, he's bringing it whether you yeah. want to deal with it That's or not. It. The will is there to make you move whether you want to or know how and where to move or not, so to speak. In other words, that's what life is. So, hence all those other expressions we have, how are you going to live it? in yesterday's moment, in the current moment, in tomorrow's moment, under your own confused sense of whatever direction, or thy will be done, thy will, right. So that's the, but you can't stop it. You know, I, I want to, to put something in here. You, you know, the, the scripture talks about um, and life and death and hell was cast into the lake of fire. Why is it that it doesn't say life? That's what it said. It said death and hell was cast into the lake of fire. Why is it that life was not put in there? Because when we think about what we call life in the natural, it's darkness. So how, how why was it not purified or cast into the lake of fire? Could it possibly be that the reason life is not is because it is impossible for life to be quote unquote impure. It is what it is. Light is what it is. And the lake of fire that it is cast into is you. The death is you. The hell is you. So when we get to the place where we think with our will, it is at that point that we began to understand what death is and what death needs from us and what hell is and what hell needs from us. And, and when I say from us, I, I, I truly believe that the, the both of them only need from us is a recognition of who we are. And, 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 and that's where the uh, whole idea of purification comes from. So when we talk about life, I think sometimes what we call life is actually death, a walk in death, as opposed to as opposed to life itself. When you're talking earlier about the uh, technology thing, Nick, and, and how we use our intellect to bring that into being and follow that because it gives us what we want, mm -hmm. I, I think that is, we call that life for living, or, or living a good life, or a comfortable life, but in actuality, it's walking death. 
but we turn with this life. It's all of his day. So you can, I think, if I can, can extrapolate out, then you can say, and, and an indicator of working, if you like, with a will that is, I don't know what word to use, correct, pure, whatever, that's not you, is your intuition. There's a connection there, isn't there? I think the thing we call intuition is actually the spiritual essence. It's, it's thinking with the spirit. It's, so, it's, but my point is, if you have an intuitive sense of something, then this is to do something. It's it's the will and the service of. We characterize it as intuitive, but it's that ultimate <clears throat> spiritual source, right? Or or direction. It, it has to be that, Richard, because okay. because um. In another portion of the scripture, it says, and the devil was cast into the lake of fire. So it separates the devil, hell, and death. But we don't. So all of those have to mean something. And I think what it's doing is not so much looking at um, a devil or a hell or a death as we see them, but it's looking at how we live this thing that we call life. And I think all of those things are illustrations of what we call life. And we haven't a clue of what life actually is unless we allow what we call intuition or the spiritual essence to, um, to dominate the intellect or uh, to, to use the intellect as a tool for, for um, bringing into manifestation an awareness of who we are in terms of Elohim or in terms of God itself. Yeah, because I'm, I'm aware of cultures. Uh, more Mauritius, other places where people, and, and I believed her. I worked with a, a woman short term thing, and she said, I don't know what it is, but my mother and I know exactly what the other one is feeling, and we can be 8,000 miles away. So that's a respect and an appreciation of an intuitive grasp of something. But in our culture, we bifurcated that and chopped it up into so many pieces, we don't trust it anymore. And in, paradoxically, I almost think it's science. That, are, that discovers things is using an intuitive, you, you know, that aha moment is an intuitive, hey, look, it connects. That's not just, I mean, the reason math works is because it's sort of based on that, I think. But I would think a lot of discovery is like that. You have a sense of go in this direction or do that or connect this. It's not something you read, you know what I mean? It's yep. not the intellect. Because then when you do, when you read the readings, uh, what, what Einstein wrote and stuff, go back to, you know, uh, um, Newton, Kabbalah, all that. Where was that coming? That's got to be the aha, intuitive, so it's a, this, yeah. So in a way, ironically, or paradoxically, this thing we call science, which is really the separation of all of that intuitive from the, the computer-like thinking, still ultimately depends on that connection for something new to be discovered more often than not, I think. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think that when, you, when, we yeah. Talk, when we talk about the disconnect. At least what we call great discoveries can and have that at a source. And, and, and I think there's a connection that's still there, but we think it's not there. Well, And the reason we yeah. think that something is new is because as Nick said earlier, uh, the quote-unquote science is, is open to new things. And he allows the light of that to come into uh, his capacity to think. And we see that as an Einstein being highly intellectual, uh, the, uh, or the writers of the Zohar in terms of the Gamalah being highly intellectual, when in essence all they were uh, was listening to this still small voice by virtue of opening themselves up. Because if, if scientists searching for something, they're actually opening themselves up, but they don't see it as a spiritual thing. They see it as a scientific discovery. Except I think if you get inside, if you can talk quietly and privately to the real, quote, great scientists, they'll tell you 
the, they know there's a connection. Well, Einstein said. Well, it wasn't only he, yeah. others too, but they don't throw it out there in the newspaper. But, and, and yet, what was I going to say? I was going to tie it into our favorite subject, the church, but which doesn't. Oh, the, the one fundamental thing that I respect in the scientific method, which can be a mess, is prove the theory wrong. Prove it wrong. Stick your finger in the hole. I mean, you don't find that in church. Everything we just told you this morning, we tell you is true. They don't say, spend the rest of the week proving it wrong, which is the way to val find the validation in it. They just say, take it. Or they try to word game you into the corner where you go, okay, I'll find it. I, you know, mm -hmm. I can't be here. That, that's not truth. You know what I'm saying? So there, there is an honesty in science, in the method. I say that knowing that you can also just see what you want to see in science and make theories, so, yeah. which of course works in the other as well. So, but anyway. Your time, Nick. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I definitely agree. Well, it makes sense. Um, where did I want to go? <laughs> oh. So, when we talk about learning to be still so we can hear that still small voice, which is the influence of our higher self, and who we actually are is a creator. Um, when we come to the fork in the road and we learn to listen to the influence of that still small voice and our higher self, rather than immediately run around in circles with our intellect, um, what we are actually doing is learning to be what we create. We were our, what we are, what we have been created to be, uh, which is a creator, a co-creator. So, when you connect to the still small voice and you hear the decision of left to right, what you're actually doing is participating in a process of creating something. The intellect only knows how to ask questions and then weigh the pros and cons, and then hopefully come up with a, it basically just randomly guesses based on how much information it can stack up on the pro or con side of the situation. Who and what you actually are doesn't ask questions. You make it whatever you want it to be. So, no, no, when you... Before you... Yeah. Did you understand? What you, everybody got what you're saying. Mm. You know, that's a profound statement. Say it again. Let me say it again. Yeah. <laughs> so we talk about connecting to the creator and the reality of who what we are is a portion of the creator and is a, a co-creator. What the creator does is create. So the intellect asks questions and essentially guesses based on what it thinks is best. But the reality of who and what you are does not ask questions, it does not guess. It chooses what it wants. So when you listen to that still small voice, you are responding to a process of creating the very circumstances that you are having all this confusion about. And you're participating in creating whatever circumstances you want. And it's not just what you want in terms of ego want, it's what your innermost desire is, which is to be as close to the creator as possible. And to be close to the creator, you have to be a creator. So if you're creating what you want, what you want, in other words, if you choose left or right, that still small voice says you need to go right. And you are creating that action and that the results of that decision. Um, the question is, why do you want that? Nick, <clears throat> Nick. Yeah. is that the same voice that Audrey said told her to take her foot off the brake? Is that the same voice? So what my mom did was create the situation where she did not get hit by that truck or whatever it was. That is the circumstance she chose to manifest herself in. 
as a result of participating with that still small voice in the process of creating this physical experience. Even though she didn't know what she was creating? Because, I mean, I don't know what you were thinking at the time, Audrey, but... Uh, right. I don't know. But, 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 well, she, but there's a portion of her that does know. Right. Okay. She, she knew. Okay. And we are trying to move the seat of our awareness deeper into that portion of ourselves that does know. So we can walk in it consciously all the time. Okay. And in that situation, when the thinking mind got shut down because of the stressful, stress, stressful situation, um, it allowed for the influence of what she actually knew to be more present in her conscious awareness. Yeah? The thinking, her thinking would say, what should I do? Mm -hmm. The still small voice doesn't ask what should I do, it just does it. Yeah, you, you see, but yeah. but but it's a but you re we had an accident. If you're gonna have an accident, and the guy was coming out, I saw he was going to hit her side of the car, and I swerved the car around so he hit my side. That was seconds. Yeah. So uh, so 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 what happened? We process things much faster. On that level. Yeah, yeah. On that uh, when there's a stressful situation, we process much faster than we. Uh, that we're aware of. But it's almost more than a processing. It's a simple doing. Doing, yeah. And responding. Okay. Right. Um, Recognizing the situation and responding to it. I mean, the, yeah. it, it skips the, almost like it skips, once we learn that connection, it's almost like it skips the steps of processing because part of the processing is I do this because or I do this because or it's like the intellect. The, the, it, it, it's it's when you said when you said that about the intellect, I put the intellect asks questions, and the still still voice, small voice knows all the answers already. Yeah. Okay. So when you're connected to the still small voice, um, there's no time for the question in some situations. Right. In terms of the mind taking the time to formulate it, it's it's connected to the still small voice, and you you simply do. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Well, I, I don't want to say it does that resonate. Yeah, but I, I, I would also inject maybe the idea that on that level, I mean, wh what do we understand in a very crude way? That if you stand on top of the Empire State Building with a watch and there's a person on the ground, you don't have the same time. So in other words, if you think of skins of an onion, when you go to the core, which is the intuitive, it time could be said to be there, but it operates on a whole different notion. So you can say there's no time, but there was on that level, right? I mean, I think you can say that. The question is if you can act, how else can but you access... But how we would ordinarily define time in right. the physical realm because we is it, not. We, we define it on that more superficial, it's fixed, right. here it is, it's right, right here. It's not about me, it's it about cuts this all machine that. I made which tells me what time needs to be, right? But you go to the intuitive level, it's a whole different kind of clock, so to speak. But there's still a process which is then I think how you get connected to being in a universal space versus local space so you can be here or there at the same time. You can see, the, you can see faster. Oh well, yeah, I mean, what is, what is sometimes you experience horrific things and they go in slow motion. Mm -hmm. So I remember watching this accident happen and I saw every detail because it went in slow motion. Mm -hmm. It's I mean, like, it's like time slowed down. You step outside of the realm of time. It's but like you would, I would. I would argue maybe <clears throat> you went deeper into more an intuitive understanding of the situation. Where there was no where time. time can operate so much slower so you can see the details. You know what I'm saying? Well, see, but it's there not is slower. No time. I'm there saying is, that in the other realm there is no time. It's a different movement. Mm -hmm. That time does not it exist. Is. The only reason well, time exists is because we measure the distance between two objects. And if there is no there, and there is no here in the, in the spirit realm, then there is no time. Because there are no objects to measure the distance between. That's what time is. How long does it take us to get from one object to the other? And if, if she, uh, when, when Andrew was describing the slow motion of it all, it's as though she was manifesting, we are in this world, but not of this world. But you were outside of that realm of, of what was taking place, and you and you saw it 
in, in, in detail and, you, and, the, and the reason it was in slow motion is because subconsciously or uh, consciously you, subconscious I should say, you wanted to see or you saw everything that happened. It's like taking a, a video of it. So, so, so I don't, I don't see a, a, the, um, uh, well, I guess what I'm trying to uh, say is outside, in, uh, outside of this dimension, there is no time. And that's where you saw it from another dimension. I, I honestly believe that. And let me jump not to confuse what we just said, because I totally agree. So uh, you can think of time as we feel time passing because there are gaps in our ability to maintain awareness of reality. Yeah. So when you heighten your awareness, stuff slows down because you're actually seeing more. And it's fitting more into that same amount of time, quote unquote. Now imagine that process increasing, 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 increasing until where this physical realm feels like it feels like nothing is moving at all. But it doesn't matter though because if you reintegrate awareness of what is beyond this physical, then you can understand that things operate differently and in their own time, quote unquote, than they need to here. So I, I know we've heard uh, uh, I forget exactly where it comes from, but a thousand years is like the blinking of an eye. Um, so you could interpret that as me and Greta blinks its eye really slowly. <laughs> <laughs> but that's from our perspective. Right. Well, that's uh, it always <laughs> But the, the other thing that it makes me think of is uh, years ago I learned in physics the, the concept of a pendulum on a clock. Okay? At the point, or the in, it's like the Big Bang Theory, the instant of or just before or after the pendulum changes direction at the end of its swing, it disappears. Mm -hmm. That's where time has stopped, and so it, is, it doesn't exist. Because you need time for existence, in, a, in the sense that we define it. So we, there's a, intuitively I sense there's a connection between that notion. So if you go deep, 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 so to speak, and time stops, you're in total connection with the universal. So you don't exist in that sense, in, in that, I guess we have to use the term instant. This is where words become our This ideas. is, let me, yeah, exactly. And let me, when you go deep like that, you move to the center point for your source, and you become the butterfly that creates hurricanes out in the external world right. by doing absolutely nothing except being who you are. Now, I'm going to get back to that um, distill small voice um, choosing what it wants to create as opposed to us thinking about what we want. But um, that's why the Mayans called the uh, center of the galaxy the cosmic butterfly. Good. And I know Sheldon knows about that. <laughs> Radiate, radiating outwards from the center, everything else is effective. So you can appear to do absolutely nothing and yet still have the greatest effect physically. Because the physical is an external experience. The inner self is where everything begins. And if you get it right in the beginning, or you make a small change in the beginning, by the time it gets out here, who knows what happens. Whatever you want can happen. But isn't that also part of the conundrum or whatever, it's conceivably possible that you could access that and still be in some way self, what's the word, ignorant? So that... Well, yeah, you can, the I'm difference thinking, between mastery and look, still being look, a student. Look at the movie Inception. What's that all about? you got to be very careful how you go inside an idea and reconstruct it from the beginning because of all the ramifications that come with or there's that other movie that came out where the guy kept trying to change the future so he wouldn't keep killing his girlfriend or whatever it was, that kind of thing. It's the slightest little thing. So it makes me think, it's, it's conceivable, is it not, that you could find a way to access well, a profound see, level of that source? Well, think of going inside or whatever and bringing our intellect with it. 
with us and applying our intellect to whatever we find there. And that way we'll screw stuff up. Right. Yep. And, and I think that's what we do. We, 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 we take the intellect with us and or, or we, we see something and we try to, to uh, intellectualize about it. It's like we, we see ourselves being separate from the Creator is no different than taking a, a cup of water from the ocean. It doesn't mean that the water is not a part of the ocean, but rather than reconnecting to the ocean, you pull the water on the ground and it evaporates. Now the, that water has no connection to the ocean in his mind, and it rains, and it doesn't know where it's going to end up. And that's kind of how scattered we are. We, we, we feel like we're disconnected, but connected to another source, which we call the human, and we don't, we don't quite know where we're going to end up, but, it, but we keep thinking and trying to figure out and guessing what we should do next. And, and I, I believe that, that the whole idea of, of religion ha, has been and still is guessing what to do next as opposed to feeling what to do next. And instead of being in the cup, being poured on the ground, it's a desire to be back into the ocean. And, and the desire to be back into the ocean is what puts you back into the ocean. And, and once you're in there, there is no you. There, it's just the ocean. So, so that's, how I, I, that's how we uh, were created to be. We just are. And these individual, what we see as individual bodies, are simply cups that has taken water out of the ocean. And it's just, just going where it chooses, as opposed to where it needs to. But should, should we say that a little bit differently? I don't know. Well, no, I'm just I'm asking, because it's obviously what turns around in me sometimes, too. This whole notion of what happens to the you and you when you die, so to speak. Yeah. But if what you just said is, the analogy is true, you still have a sense that I'm one with the ocean. There's still an I there. But you don't try to, where's my arm, where's my leg, where's my boundary, if you know what I mean. But I would think... But that's it, Richard. That's the I that we have left with us. But it's not like suddenly it's like, uh, I can't, yeah. you know what I mean? There's the no I, I. The I am still a part of the ocean. But I don't know how to get back to the ocean. So I create a religion that connects me to the ocean on my own terms. My intellect has brought into being this religion that has this God that, that uh, is beyond me. Yeah. That's, but the I still recognizes that something is missing. And then you end up in a setting where there's a search for what we call the thing that's missing, whatever, you know, however you want to term it. Well, I mean, hence we say I, I versus I am, right? Yes. I am, there's still a gap. <coughs> I, I, but there's still I. Well, that's you know, the, I mean, it's weird saying it. There's no such thing as I am. In the, in the uh, Hebrew or yeah. in the Aramaic, it is I, I. Ani, ani is I, I. It, it, if you truly translate it the way it is written, it does not say know that I, I, that I am. It says know that I, I is. That's what, it, that's what it actually says. Well, it doesn't didn't. say be still and know that I am God. It says uh, be at peace knowing that I, I is Elohim. That's what it says. Okay, so we, we say I am and that starts the delusion. Yeah. Because it creates that teeny, teeny, tiny little gap. <laughs> and off you go. Now, but, but the other side of that is it makes me appreciate, but then whatever with the intellect, because the intellect's trying to protect me. But it's destroying me. It's giving me a religion. It's trying to help me deal with the un unknowing, but the it's unknown. Destroying. It's destroying me. But it's an energy that's strong, very strong, and of course I guess I feed it and make it stronger. That's the problem, out of ignorance, so there's no balance. But it, its inclination is to give you what you need. You see what I'm saying? No, I think the intellect's inclination is to give you what you want. So and the spirit is to give you what you need. <laughs> All right, well, That's we're, it. We're turning so because we have the most of our awareness is caught up in the intellect, um, then it, the 
you know, like, it, it's exactly what you just said, dead, anyway. Um, it does serve you, but if you don't connect it to its own source, or you don't right. connect to our own source, then, you know, like, just gets more and more convoluted and confusing, and it ends up destroying us. Well, I mean, look at all around you. Everything around you is the intellect trying to protect something. And, and we see all the distorted results that come from that, and so we're at odds with, with read the paper, right? So that's an intellect out of control kind of thing. Lost its source. <coughs> sense of connection. Sorry, I can't believe it. It's going to be scared. <laughs> and you can't be afraid if you want to be complete or be whole. So danger is real and fear is a choice, right? Isn't that enough? Yep. That's the new movie now. Gotta go see that. With Will Smith, I don't know. We'll see how they do that. <laughs> um, so I wanted to come back to uh, just what we were talking about earlier was uh, um, when my mom was described in a car accident and she was to still small voice. And we just talked about that actually being a process of creating the circumstances she wanted to or her innermost self desired to. Um, so when we reconnect or begin to uh, reincorporate into our awareness who and what we actually are, we come to a greater understanding of the fact that we are the creators of our own reality because we were created to be creators. And in order to connect to the creator, you have to be like it. So, and just Pastor Richard was talking about, we see time as separation of events in realms that are outside of what we think of as time. Um, there is nothing resembling separation as a physical space. Uh, separation is only whether one thing resembles another thing. In that, in that sense, things are distinct. They're not really separate. But anyway, I said that to say, uh, if you want to know the Creator, you have to become like the Creator, because it takes a God to know Hashem. Let me say that again. Uh, it takes a God, in the sense that ye are gods, it takes a God to know Hashem. But that's the shame of here are Israel, the Lord, our God is one. Here are Israel, the Lord, our actually saying the same. Instead of it takes one to know one, it takes God to know God. Well, isn't that where it takes one to know one comes from? Basically? Even if it's I don't know what yep. it takes from there. Um, and I'll try to explain that again when we come back to it. But anyway, so. The situation where you didn't get crushed by the car, mom, is what your innermost self desired to create. And because you shut down the thinking in that situation, you connected to it and agreed to go along with its flow, that is what was produced. Now my question was why? So we want to connect to all this stuff in us and essentially do what we want. The question is why is it that we want what we want? So if we have our awareness totally in the intellect, then what we want, we don't have a clue about, trust me. <laughs> um, we think we, and just like Dad said, or my dad said, <laughs> our, our intellect attempts to give us what we think we need, trying to protect us or whatever. Oh, I need food, I need shelter, all that is good. I need entertainment, I need all this stuff, I need all this stuff, it gives me pleasure. But in our innermost self, that is not what we truly want. That's what we think we want, because we can't think with anything other than our intellects. When you learn how to think with that still small voice or your will, you can connect to your innermost self uh, more so, and be able to feel what it is you truly desire, and move in sync with that desire. And, just like my mom experienced, the desire of your higher self or your innermost self of the creator that you are is to create an environment that is conducive to the great 
purpose and the great work for which we are even in the physical experience in the first place, which is to know who and what we are. You can't know who and what you are if you're busy being hit by a car. <laughs> so in that case, when you connect to your inner self and choose the circumstances you wish to experience, you are connecting to the desire of the creator that you are to create a harmonious physical existence. So the creator wanted to choose that because it knew, or you knew, um, that that was the best set of circumstances that could exist that would allow the great work to continue because you got to stay in the physical in order to fi figure out the physical experience and redeem it. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So, the reason that the, the wants and desires that are at our very core have to do with the very desires and intentions of the Creator that created us, that we are connected to. And, just like I said, it has to do with maintaining an environment that allows for us to keep learning. Because this is the place of learning. And, that's what we do. When we're not working on ourselves, we work on what, we appear to, what appears to us as external. So we can help bring it back into balance. Now we don't only try to do that physically. Um, when you connect to that desire in you, as we just showed with the cards in the example, you can bring about those circumstances by sheer existence, by the fact that you have connected to who and what you actually are. Now because obviously we're not in those situations all the time, it's very stressful and difficult to maintain that normally. We have to practice. And as I was saying before, the difference between a master and someone who is a student is that a master can be in that state all the time. And a student bounces back and forth. Because there's all this stuff that they're still learning how to deal with and, and bring to balance and make quiet so that you can actually keep going. And there's a saying, um, I think it's, it's in a commentary on a book called The Kibalion and um, something called The Emerald Tablets. Uh, and the people who are writing the book and explaining the stuff, uh, I think they say that, yeah. Um, they don't identify themselves by name, they call themselves the three initiates. Um, but they say that a master of the way, of the spiritual tradition that we are all part of, a master move, moves from will to will. At no point does thinking or egotistical desire or all that stuff that we usually have to deal with enter that circumstance. Um, so let me explain that a bit more. So a master moves from will to will. So if we're sitting on the couch watching TV, we don't get up unless we have to. <laughs> Right. Get and to get we the have to because, oh, I'm uncomfortable, oh, I'm hungry, oh, i got to get some water, I've got to change the channel, yada, 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 yada. Yeah. So we are responding to the influence of all these um, desires and little things and stuff that we present. So in that sense, we've made a willful decision, but we've made a decision primarily in the best interest of our own physical self. And in that sense, it was not a truly original decision. It was not a real creation of the Creator Self that we are. It was more so a response to something that we don't like. And an intellectual manipulation of the situation to bring us back to the place where we'd be comfortable again. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, let me, and a master moves from will to will means that your decisions are not based on 
what you feel to be uncomfortable and satisfying to your ego at the moment. Your decisions are based on that connection to your inner self and that still small voice. And they are based in creating original situations that allow for this whole process to continue for real. Instead of just making it, making ourselves more comfortable at the moment. For example, I mean, you say creating original situations. What do you mean by original? Well, in the sense that I meant that if we were to sit on the couch watching TV, our response to to the desire to be more comfortable or to water or to food is not an original creation in the sense that all it is is a reaction to that desire. To maintain physical comfortableness. Yeah, I got that part. Now it's not saying that we don't have those desires because obviously we have to maintain uh, the physical in order to use it. But the primary goal is not maintaining a comfortable physical situation. It is moving with the flow of the inner self, and in that sense, creating an original decision or situation or set of circumstances that is. A, something that is brought from within you instead of a reaction to something that you face that comes from outside. Oh, so so meditation would be something like that because you, I mean, you re resist the uncomfortableness or the need to go get some water or whatever, whatever. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the from wheel to wheel. The one sitting on the, on the couch is about themselves or the physical material world, whether it be the human or whatever. But moving from will to will is not egotistical or selfish because the desire <coughs> is not for the one moving from will to will as much as it is willing um, the human to recognize that it is not human. And everything that the master does is in that direction. It's not to satisfy the master, but it is to bring an awareness to the human. Yeah. Regardless of what it takes. Sheldon was either insulting us or he had a question with his hand. Oh, yeah. No, the only thing I was asking is when uh, Nick said just insulting. now, as far as like sitting on the couch, etc. So are you saying uh, any time you're just trying to recreate an experience that pretty much you enjoy or you like for whatever matter, when you say uh, something that is actually comfortable, when you were saying more so an original, something original versus uh, just being comfortable? Um, yeah. In, in the sense that our desire to remain comfortable is a secondary thing in response to something else as opposed to looking past all that stuff that is our ego wants to deal with yeah. or wants to have satisfied and going to the inner true nature of it all and moving with that. I, I think that... Oh, I was going to say, uh, so if we look at, at Buddhism, um, there's a situation that's told in the story of Siddhartha and that was good. This might actually address whatever it was you were just thinking about. Um, in uh, where Siddhartha, who becomes the Buddha, or an enlightened one, um, goes to live with these uh, ascetics in the forest. And their whole thing is to, to basically totally disregard the body, put it through all these terrible situations, and, you know, ignore pain and all this stuff, and through that process, uh, become enlightened. But he realized that after doing this for a while, his body was destroyed, it was emaciated, that it wasn't producing anything. What he realized in that situation was that they had put that process of negating the physical self over the actual inner true nature of what is going on. So in other words, we have to maintain this physical body, so you have to go get stuff, but you don't where you recognize that that is a subordinate action or desire. And you don't put 
the needs of the physical self or the you don't put your attention all on the physical self. You give it just as much attention as it needs in order to keep it going. But your inner attention is directed at something that is um, more real and the actual what we actually should be doing. And so just to relate back to the story again, so Siddhartha uh, he left the forest group of those monks because he recognized that what they were doing was essentially having a contest to see how far they could push their physical bodies. They weren't actually doing anything. Now they fought this because they applied their ego and their intellect to the situation. Rather than allowing what was in them to flow through them. There's no there's no rigidness with what the spirit wants you to do. Um, I know that there's a branch of where, at least when you read about it, like the, the Gnostic Christians, apparently there was a group of them that was exactly the same way. So spirit is good, physical is bad, do whatever you want with physical because destroying it will get you closer to the creator. No. <laughs> that is actually just the application of your ego to whatever the situation is. Yeah, you, you can see that also in, uh, what's it, it's more Shia, but it was in the Christian religion too, the, it seems to be more still alive in the Spanish aspect of it, the self-flagellation and all that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And, see, it's very hard to talk about this because we can, we can see that and be like, oh, it's obviously, they don't need to do that, but what's going on internally in them is... We can't, well, we don't know that. It's the desire with which you approach it determines whether or not it is beneficial for you or own spirit or whether or not you're just getting more caught up in your own ego or whatever. Now, do I think you need to, like, beat yourself and make yourself bleed? No. Can that be used in that, in the, the way that is actually conducive to enlightenment? I mean, But I don't think it's necessary at all. No thanks. I'll um, say to each his own. Well, what was it? The the, the, the Da Vinci Code? I'll take that guy who was the assassin, exactly. mm -hmm. who kept putting the thorns on his thigh and stuff. His yeah. whole thing was the pain. Yeah. And, but, but see, it's an archive. And wow. we look at that. We look yeah, at that. Exactly. From, the from, pain becomes the artificial thing. Yeah. But but then we look at that from from the you know, self flagellation like the Philippines, like easterly. The other self across, etc. That's what that's the extra. One. But it also happens on the emotional level, mm -hmm. where where our, our ego pushes us in, 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 into areas that we label as um, uh, uh, things that we must do to make us more enlightened. Uh, reading your Bible every day, uh, thinking about scriptures. Or um, just how you feel emotionally towards someone who does not believe what you believe, or do not move in the way that you move in terms of the spiritual. So, so it, it's not just on a uh, physical level. It's, it, it's definitely also emotional, and I think the most dangerous is emotional well, because we don't see it. That's the um, that whole thought process that we're filthy rags and we're not worthy and. Um, very dangerous kind of thought that pervades a lot of Christianity. But that, but that's, and it's in the scriptures, mm -hmm. but it's taken out of context. Sure. Right. Yeah, it's, it's taken out you, of context. You, you need to hear it said by the Dalai Lama while he's laughing, and then maybe you connect with what it means. You know what I'm saying? But if you hear it by some guy in a zoot suit standing behind a podium on Sunday pointing at you, you're not going to get the same message. Well, what Isaiah is actually saying is that in, in, my, in my current state, when I compare it to who I'm supposed to be, I'm this filthy race. That's what he's actually doing. In, yeah. in other words, he's saying that... But it's not punishing, he's not punishing no, he's not himself, himself by saying it, but I think that's the way Denise is saying you, you get the message. <coughs> you're a sinner. He, he recognizes this. You know, you'll never make it. So, anyway.
Hopefully we're past that. We're working on it. No, I think we all sinners. Saved by grace. Because we got entanglements. Well, but I don't, I don't mean... Are oh, you talking about the classical sin? I'm talking about, I'm talking about the Christmas carol when oh. it's the ghost of things past and you can't let go of the baggage. Oh, okay. Yeah, then you're a sinner, but then you're down in the quagmire in the mud. You're never coming out. That's not the sinner you want to be. I'd rather be a sinner who goes, oh, okay, don't do that again. You know what I'm saying? Let go of it. Gotcha. Not like a prostitute who can't do anything else because she won't let go. You know, I don't know, didn't even know there, but I just, yeah. it was on TV and people don't appreciate how hard it is. And then we judge each other. Is that the door? No. Okay, anyway. That's Janice. Oh. Was it wasn't me. No, it's no, just this. Or playing with them in that newfangled. I'm not playing around, I'm just sitting here. I just received something. Okay. And it, <laughs> and it lets me know. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Loose for technology over there. <laughs> Y'all should, should all become Amish. <laughs> How would we yeah, talk right. to you? Right. Yeah, now, now they got that new reality That's show breaking up, or whatever it is. No. I mean, they even they're even going <laughs> after that. <laughs> <My> God, <laughs> won't leave anybody alone. Well, then, but yeah, so that so in the in Buddha's phrase, you have to let go of all desire. I think that's what's behind that. Just when you're hungry, eat. Fine, and get up and. Now, the trick is, inside the act of eating, taste what you're eating. It's not, well, it's not go get... by the McDonald's, grab a hamburger, stuff it in your mouth, and that's eating. It's not, that's not what that's saying. It doesn't create a McDonald's. Right? Yeah, and, and, and exactly what you're saying is, like, you have to eat, but don't make the desire to eat and the need to eat your God. So let go of that. No, but the trick, I think, is to, but still, you're allowed, so to speak, to taste all of the tastes that are in the food that you're eating because it should make you eat what's more nourishing for your body and in an appropriate quantity, you know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, so, I think we're drinking uh, Coke's and, and hamburgers because we're not uh, tasting any of it. Sex is supposed to feel really, really good. Right. But it is the other end of that. Which means and you don't to deny need. it is egotistical. To to make it your goal is egotistical. Okay, you got food, sex, and to deny it is to bring yourself <laughs> to bring yourself out of, the, out of balance. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Well, that's so that, you, what you say, but intercourse is about intercourse is about balance. It's supposed to be anyway, but, but, but when it when it comes for the sheer purpose of fulfilling what you perceive to be a need, then that's totally out of balance. It, it has to be done uh, for the purpose for which it was created, don't you think? And that's the unicity of the male and female, um, the male and female energies. Because uh, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't see that much difference between uh, sex and food in terms of desiring it, because because food to me is a waste of time. You know, if I could get by without eating, I would, because I, I could be doing something else. That's, that's just how I feel about eating. We don't have um, the same taste. I, I don't love that, but when I do eat, I, I want to eat well. You know, I want to I want to eat something that's good. I'm not going to go to McDonald's as Richard was talking about. And, but then the other thing is that the. The, the, the reason we don't see the spiritual essence of intercourse is because that's the last thing that anyone wants to talk about. That's the main thing that you cannot discuss in a religious setting. And, and I believe that that's done for the, for the mere purpose, of the sheer purpose of, this, of, of, of us not realizing the power that's in intercourse and what transpires during the, during the intercourse. Yeah, because the whole go ahead, go ahead, spiritual Nick. truth of what this whole process is, which would make religion as we understand it today totally irrelevant, is found in breaking down what sexuality actually is. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
was going to say, and the, the reason thing. women are marginalized and all of that comes from religion um, all of it is because when men get in these situations and they see uh, a beautiful woman they're like oh and all these supposedly evil feelings arise within them and of course they would place the blame on the woman as opposed to themselves yeah. um, and then make a whole system around it which is a bunch of BS that is supposed to happen to men and men are supposed to be men and deal with it And by dealing with it, it's not talking about just because you see her and you're attracted to her, that's what you go after. Dealing right. with it is, is dealing with the uh, restraint of it all. The whole idea of, um, uh, uh, well not the whole idea, but a part of the idea of circumcision on the eighth day was to remind a man to control his sexual desires. Regardless of, of uh, who he is externally attracted to, it has to be an internal connection before it can be made real. And that's the process of, of lifting the serpent up. Um, as opposed to using that sexual desire to bring you whatever your ego finds pleasurable and having the serpent continue to eat dust or whatever. Or you just took the last three minutes of what Nick said, we said, put that on public TV. You'd have to make sure nobody knew your name and where you lived. People come yeah. after you. And, and you know, you, you're right. People come after you. I'll put my face I'll put my name on. <laughs> I'll put my name on my telephone on. I, I, I really, really, this is one of the things that I, if there's anything that we ever talked about or shall talk about, uh, uh, in, in an effort to understand that I would really, really want to out there in the public, regardless of what the consequences are, is sex, sexuality. That's the most misunderstood um, aspect of, of life itself. And, 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 and it's so manipulated <clears throat> by males, and the reason it's misunderstood is because of how males deal with it. You know. I remember um, the um, one, one of the churches I pastored in, uh, in the beginning was um, there was uh, this young lady who had a baby, and I had just gotten there, and I was told she could not sing in the choir until she came down front and confessed her sin of having the baby. And my question was, okay, what does what the dude that did it? And he said right there also. <laughs> so this is not going to happen. All right, to make a long story short, I'm in the hospital on maternity ward visiting somebody, and the very person who was pushing for me to do that was in a room with somebody having his baby who was not his wife. So the standards there are based upon maleness. Now, it was acceptable to males that he did that, but it was not acceptable concerning the female Restoration for the male is, if you say you're sorry, it's fine. Restoration for a female is, you got to embarrass yourself in front of everybody, or you got to become a spectacle. That is the same issue that says women should dress a certain way and shouldn't go out at a certain time at night because all of the responsibility is placed on females to keep from getting raped, as opposed to exactly. training men or teaching men and young boys not to see women as objects that they can take willy-nilly. Exactly, and, and that's the whole concept. That's why the reason that it exists is, is because of how religion pushes it outside of, 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 the, of the, the um, spectrum of understanding. Um, when, when I dealt with my youth, that's all I talked about, sexuality. And, 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 and I, I got a lot of flack from it, but I got results as, as males respecting females and, and vice versa. It's all, it's like one that we, we say and don't think about is um, if you didn't take it, he wouldn't do it. That's putting it on the female, you see, as opposed to he, he shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing this. We never put it on him and, and 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 then we also 
look at the intimacy of, of the male with, you know, with your chest stuck out. And with the female, with, are you kidding me? Did you do that? Because why? Because sexuality is, is not seen as a spiritual uh, manifestation of anything. It's seen as um, an act of self-gratification, period. And, and that gratification on the male side comes from the female. That's crazy, but that's what it's seen. Let, let, let me say this. Let a male get to a place where, where he has, well, the female says no. He got a problem here. You know? It's like. <laughs> That's why they invented push ups. <laughs> Sorry. I'm <laughs> jogging. Uh, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Make myself into a better male. Yeah. Is actually what that is. <laughs> yeah. It's <a> gym. <laughs> Gotta do something. Yeah. Because you obviously will not be doing anyone. <laughs> and that's exactly how this whole dance works. It, it is. The male's like, look what I got. And the female's like, I don't want that. And he's like, crap, I gotta go back to the drawing board and figure out what I'm talking about. <laughs> and naturally, that's how evolution is supposed to work in terms of a psychological, spiritual way. But when we involve the ego, we just, we destroy it. Half the jokes you hear in the comedy show. <laughs> right. Anyway, you want to stop here on that? Yeah. Okay. I think so. Okay. I thought you were fine with it. The light of the truth that we are resonates with the truth of the light. That we are all and all are, all is us. We are one. Amen. Amen. Hey Sheldon with your clean head. <laughs> <laughs>